It's time for Andor, Episode 4. Much like the first three episodes, this ain't no bore. With this new episode, the plot further thickens, and with new characters, mysteries, Easter eggs, and more. Ugh, I'm tired of rhyming. This is becoming a chore. I'm Chris Goodmakers, and here's everything you missed in Episode 4 of Andor. The opening Star Wars logo now has B2 EMO alongside series icons such as Darth Vader, BB-8, C-3PO, Kylo Ren, R2-D2, and your favorite flavors of Stormtrooper. It just goes to show that the character designers at Lucasfilm know when they've struck gold. Cassian mentions that the Rebellion is split up into several factions, naming off the Guerrilla Faction, the Partisan Front, and the Titular Alliance. This lines up with Saw Gerrera's faction being referred to as the Partisans in Rogue One, and deepens the cultural roots of Star Wars to that of the French Resistance of World War II, which was also composed of individual groups operating in cells so that no single group would be the downfall of the Resistance. Also, given the circumstances, the Rebellion could be seen as a terrorist organization at this stage, at least according to Randall from Clerks. Luthen hands Cassian a Skystone Kyber Crystal as a down payment to keep him on board with the Rebellion. We're not exactly sure how he got it himself, but what's interesting about it is the color. Blue is easily the most iconic lightsaber color, next to red. Wielded by the Jedi Knights, the color represents that of the Protector, one who embodies calm, trust, stability, and loyalty. I don't know if you've noticed, but Cassian doesn't really embody any of these traits. Is this meant to foreshadow his journey? Will he come to embody these traits as he learns to cooperate with the seedlings of the Rebel Alliance? Or is the way he receives this trinket indicative of his reluctance to do so? Only time will tell. Well, I guess time already has told. He exploded on a beach. This episode marks the first time we've seen Coruscant in any of the movies or live action shows between Revenge of the Sith and Return of the Jedi's re-release. No, that one episode of Kenobi does not count. That was a flashback. During this period, everyone's favorite ecumenobolis looks drab, depressing, and utterly sanitized, keeping it in line with the Blade Runner vibes established in the first episode. The departure from the neon of the prequels is tragically befitting of the stark homogeny of the Empire's garb. Upon arriving at the Rebel meetup point, Luthen tells Cass to pick a fake name to use while he's on the operation. He chooses the name Clem, which is the name of his adoptive father, who is the man who rescued him alongside Marva and B2 in the previous episodes. All we really know about Clem is that sometime between the first episode and that flashback, he was executed by the Empire. By the way, if you were confused about when that flashback took place, it's before the start of the Clone Wars, and the ship Cassian boarded may have been an early Separatist vessel. Things can get confusing when you have a flashback in a prequel to a prequel to the first film in a series that's actually the fourth entry in the story. Oh god, now I have a headache. I'm gonna go lie down for a bit. Okay, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. What, what, what's next? Oh, the goats! There's not much else to say here other than there are some normal goats in Star Wars now. They don't even have silly alien names. Do they still make cheese? As Cassian meets the blossoming Rebel Alliance, we see that their weaponry consists of guns. No, not laser guns. Guns. They're all just carrying AK-47s. This was an element of the show lambasted by critics and fans alike when the full-length series trailer dropped in August. As usual, the so-called Star Wars fanbase needs to drink some blue milk and meditate in a swamp. First, we haven't even seen them pull the triggers yet. They very well could be blaster rifles that intentionally appear as crude anachronistic weaponry to highlight the difference between the fully funded Imperial War Machine and the ragtag Rebel Alliance. Second, if they were real, it's not like there isn't a precedent for it in the larger Star Wars universe. Fans of the EU are sure to be aware of the R-20 Scatter Blaster, a handheld blaster model that fired a large burst of tiny bolts. This served as a particularly effective weapon against the Jedi, as blocking that many shots at once was nearly impossible. It also serves as a visual metaphor as the AK has been the rifle of choice for rebel groups and insurgents across the globe. See that one scene in Lord of War for more information. 
As Luthen makes a case for Cassian with the rebel leader, we see Cass is tempted to take control of Luthen's ship and fly off. As he stares longingly at the controls, the ship's AI asks him, Something I can help you with. We don't see much more of the onboard AI this episode, but this interaction brings to mind two things. K2SO, Sasspot Supreme, and the best character in Rogue One. And L337, everyone's favorite droids rights activist turned Millennium Falcon navigation system. Now we don't know if K2 will make an appearance in this show, despite it building up to the events of Rogue One. But wouldn't it be cool if his origin were a sort of reverse L3? All we know about him is that he was a reprogrammed Imperial droid. But how did that happen? How did Cass and his friends end up doing it? Only time will tell. But now that we have multiple ship AIs with personalities, the doors open for a show that's just about different ships in the Star Wars universe. It'd be like Cars, but in Star Wars. Car Wars? Yeah, no, this is exactly why fans should not be in charge at Lucasfilm. As this show is about the foundation of the Rebellion, it only makes sense that we meet the characters that led it. Genevieve O'Reilly reprises her role as Mon Mothma from Rogue One, also a deleted scene in Revenge of the Sith. Mothma's been active at least since the Clone Wars. She was a senator who was an outspoken proponent of peace between the Separatists and the Republic. Additionally, she was staunchly against Supreme Chancellor Palpatine with his increased executive power that allowed him to transform the Republic into the First Galactic Empire at the end of the Clone Wars. It's nice to see that despite everything, she's extremely dedicated to the preservation of peace and democracy amongst the star systems. She's a secret MVP in the lore of Star Wars, and it's great to finally see her character expanded on. She even has troubles at home. In this episode, we find out Luthen runs an antique store on Coruscant as a front to broker backroom deals with Mon Mothma. While we don't necessarily know how he got his wealth, we can tell that he wants the Empire to crumble from within. His shop is a veritable museum of cultural artifacts from across the galaxy. We see a variety of armors that could originate anywhere from the Mandalorians to possibly the Sith itself. One set looks like Starkiller's Sith armor from the Force Unleashed or Sith armor from the Age of KOTOR. It looks like he has a Bantha horn as well. Luthen's clearly been all over the galaxy and established himself as a learned individual. Plus, that outfit looks comfy as hell. I know what I'm ordering from the Star Wars merch shop. Luthen's definitely been around the Galactic Block a few times. He made this apparent with everything he knows about Cassian, and we get a more tangible sense of that in the latest episode with him producing the Kyber Crystal and the reveal of his antique storefront. This expansive cultural knowledge positions him as a Rebel Alliance equivalent to fan-favorite Star Wars villain, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Admiral Thrawn is the living embodiment of Know Thine Enemy. He dedicates himself to understanding his opponents on a molecular level in order to achieve total victory. Well, molecular in a metaphorical sense. Thrawn's guiding principle is that in order to destroy your enemy, you must first learn everything about their history, culture, and philosophy. As of right now, we're not sure where Luthen acquired his relics. As a member of the upper class, it's possible that he may have inherited them through his lineage and connections within the Imperial Senate. Alternatively, since he's clearly posed against the Empire, it's possible that he salvaged these artifacts in an attempt to preserve the history of the various cultures the Empire has wiped out. Either way, this further cements him as the most intriguing character in the series. Given that the Mandalorian established Thrawn as a possible enemy for the Ahsoka Tano television series, wouldn't it be cool to see him in live action here first? I know we don't want to run into a Boba Fett problem where one show is continued in another, but I feel like not having Thrawn and Luthen share at least one scene is a missed opportunity. Ah, who am I kidding? Luthen's basically Cassian's Obi-Wan in this show. It's Star Wars. Every parental figure is destined to die. So far, Cassian's story has presented itself as a mirror to Jyn Erso and Rogue One. Both characters suffer from abandonment issues as each had been separated from their family due to the Empire's influence. And when we first meet them, they're only looking out for number one. Both want to keep to themselves, but find themselves sucked into the conflict once they realize that aiding the Rebellion will ultimately reunite them with their missing family members. While we're definitely seeing more of Cassian's perspective due to the format of the story, both learn that there is no clear-cut sides in this war, and you have to accept that when fighting for what you believe in. And with that, we are officially one-third done with this season. 
I don't know about you, but the distinct style and tone of this series makes it one of the most grounded Star Wars entries. Granted, that's not hard when every other entry has laser swords and space magic. However, it's refreshing to see something different. Andor returns next week, and so do I. But until then, let's remember what Luthen taught us. You can fight the power and look dope as hell doing it.